Welcome back to the 2019 Virtual Genealogy Fair. If you are following along from home, this is session number five. The lecture is for the experienced skill level and entitled Discovering and Researching Bureau of Indian Affairs School Records, and our speaker is Cody White. During this session, he will describe boarding and day school related records, both for individual students and schools in general that are found in Record Group 75, Records of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Mr. White is an archivist with the National Archives at Denver and subject matter expert for Native American related records. I am now turning the broadcast over to Cody White. Thank you and well hello there to everyone listening and watching live. I'd also like to welcome those in the future as we are recording this for posterity's sake. We are now live. It's high noon in the Mile High City, and I want to thank everyone for tuning in and listening to me talk a bit today on, on BIA Records. Next slide, please. Slide number two. Well, let's go over a bit of what my plan is for today. I'd like to start with a brief history of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, what we'll call BIA for short and its education efforts over the years. We'll look at the types of schools American Indian children attended, the types of records generated, restrictions on certain records, and those files that no longer exist. Then we'll look at what's in student case files throughout the years. We'll examine what can be found in administrative records, and then we'll wrap it all up with a research example before finishing with how to start your own research and what resources are available online. Next slide, please, slide number three. So what is the BIA? Well, with predecessor agencies dating back to nearly the start of the US, the Bureau of Indian Affairs was formally created in 1824 by the Department of War to handle relations with native populations the country pressed westward. A few decades later, the Bureau had evolved into its own agency under the purview of the newly created Department of Interior, where it remains today. The structure of the agency has varied over the years, with superintendencies covering entire territories, giving way to individual agencies, sub-agencies, substations, all created to administer to a particular tribal nation or multiple nations on one reservation. I'll mention agencies a lot today, and that's what we're talking about, a local office that works directly with one or many tribal nations. For example, the Red Lake Agency in Minnesota administers the Red Lake Reservation, home of the Red Lake Chippewa. So later the superintendencies were brought back in a fashion as area offices to manage the various agencies under their geographic location. As one can imagine, relations between the agency and the tribal nations they administer have ebbed and flowed, more often ebbed, as we will see today. Next slide please, slide number four. So as a primary connection between the government and the various tribal nations, the BIA features a pretty tortured history. And it is from one such dark chapter, that of the drive for assimilation, that BIA schools emerged from. But let's go back even further for a minute to show how the idea of education had been floating around a while. <clears throat> Excuse me. Missionaries were embarking on education efforts even before our country was founded. William & Mary in the early 1700s had one such program, and in 1819, the federal government first made funds available to support missionary schools aimed at the native population. Five years later, there were 32 missionary schools educating nearly 1,000 native children in the East. The BIA, though, at this time, having moved on largely from the trading focus with the factories, were now engrossed with the removal in the East and yet to deeply push into the West, nor really fully concern itself with education efforts. Next slide, please. Slide number five. Well, that brings us to the mid-1800s, the Treaty Era, where the federal government signed and ratified 377 treaties with various tribes. These, including the one seen here on this slide, are in our holdings and were recently the focus of a preservation and digitization program, thanks to an anonymous donor, and are all available online via our online catalog which we'll touch on more in a bit. But I digress. It was from in many of these treaties where the BIA-run schools were established, as the text would clearly call out the creation of schools or education programs. So with 
within the spate of treaties in the 1850s came the first on-reservation boarding school at Fort Simcoe on the Yakima Reservation, which opened in 1860 and was in operation until 1922. Next slide, please. Slide number six. Which brings us to the assimilation era. So by the late 1870s, this policy that had been kicked around for decades had taken firm root in the BIA and dramatically altered the lives of American Indians and what was left of their lands. So with tribes already forced on the reservations through the treaties, the new movement pushed further, contending that if American Indians adapted European-style clothing, the English language, institutional education, and the concept of land ownership and farming, they could better assimilate into the population at large. In conjunction, it was at this point we see the first non-reservation boarding schools, the most well-known, researched, written about, and referenced of which is the first, the Carlisle Institute in Pennsylvania, in operation from 1879 to 1918. The BIA was ruthless in stocking these schools with students, so much so that in 1885, Congress had to pass a law forbidding the taking of kids without parental permission, and then later specifically the tactics of withholding rations to force parents to give up children. So even seeming progressives like Estelle Rio from up in Wyoming, an early champion for women's rights, as superintendent of Indian schools from 1890 to 1910, espoused the common views that American Indians were racially inferior. So in these two school images, from schools thousands of miles apart, we see prime examples of the assimilation movement. Notice the uniforms, the Eurocentric art they're creating. There are many great books, memoirs, essays out there that well document this era and are worth checking out. Next slide, please, slide number seven. The off-reservation schools began faltering by 1920, though, with attacks from both sides. One side argued that they weren't assimilating the children well enough, and as the other side simply pointed out, they were cruel. The few that remained were able to be pickier about students. Students had to apply, and the school shifted from the militaristic sort of industrial education to more liberal arts, so vocations were still taught and encouraged. The 1928 Merriam Report, which deeply, deeply criticized the BIA's education efforts and helped usher in the Indian New Deal in the 1930s, further forced schools to change. Numerous schools closed in the 1930s, while others, most notably the Santa Fe Indian School, embraced or started to embrace Native culture and fostering Native art. So here on this slide, we see a 1935 photo from the Stewart Indian School grounds right outside Carson City, Nevada, and the uniforms, they're long gone. Jumping ahead 40 years, this Cherokee Central Elementary School classroom looks no different from a regular public school. Now a side note, this school today is in fact tribally run. Um, in 1962, the BIA shuttered all the day schools in the Koala Boundary, the land that the Eastern Cherokee bought in the early 1800s, and opened the Central Elementary School. And in 1990, it was turned over to the Tribal Council to run. So speaking of elementary schools, the public ones, Another education trend in the 20th century was the increase in Native children attending public schools, which saved the agency money and saved it from criticism, yet were no less assimilating. This is documented in the blistering 1969 Senate report on American Indian education, which, as the time frame is about where this presentation will end, as our BIA collection here at the National Archives starts to taper off at that point, with more recent records still with the agency. Next slide, please, slide number eight. So let's dive into the types of schools and start with the most well-known, the non-reservation boarding schools. These were built apart from reservations, often at former Army fort sites, and operated independently of BIA agencies, reporting directly to the BIA commissioner, and at times, as seen in both Michigan and New Mexico, superintendents of these schools would also be put in charge of nearby BIA agencies. For these reasons, these schools alone will often have their own dedicated record series in our collection, and so are the most researched and referenced. The student body was also often diverse, with students from a variety of tribal nations. Uh, speaking of Michigan, here is the Mount Pleasant School, seen on this slide, in operation from 1893 to 1934. Next slide, please. Slide number nine. 
The reservation boarding schools were those built on the reservation. Now these were the earliest of the boarding schools and it was actually from them the idea that educators needed to remove the students even further from their people to fully assimilate them that the non-reservation boarding schools emerged from. Yet these schools continued alongside. They were run under the respective BIA agency. So while there can be dedicated series to be found, often the records will be mixed in with general records, as we will see. In this slide, we see a student body photograph from the Cherokee Boarding School, an operation from 1890 to 1954. Next slide, please, slide number 10. Day schools were by far the most numerous and least controversial, given they were based on the traditional concept of a student going during the day and returning home at night. As BIA education efforts were standardized, day schools became the sort of equivalent to elementary schools, feeding students into either boarding schools or local high schools, and you could have dozens and dozens on one reservation, split up per reservation district, for example. In this slide, we see a shot of students down in New Mexico, along there with an inquisitive deer off to the left. Important to note, records for individuals attending these schools often move with the student along to their next school. So strictly day school student case files are rarer to find. As with the reservation boarding schools, records of these schools are usually mixed in with general agency records, and we'll see that later in the presentation today. Next slide, please, slide number 11. Mission schools, as mentioned earlier, were not run by the BIA, but are often erroneously thought not to be documented in our collections. So many early on were boarding schools, but they dropped that aspect. The costs were high and they couldn't retain students, so they largely switched to the day school model. And while there is not the level of detail we have for other schools, mission schools were required to submit monthly reports to the respective agency of which students were there, attendance, dates, and the like. So depending on the agency, these were sometimes saved. Many of these schools, as with the accompanying churches, are located deep in tribal lands. Uh, part of the allotment process during the assimilation era granted allotments to schools and churches. One such example, St. Anne's Indian School in North Dakota, seen in this image from our holdings, yeah, still educates Turtle Mountain Chippewa children today and is still open. Next slide, please. Slide number 12. So if an individual you're researching doesn't show up in any BIA school records, there is a strong chance they simply attended a public school, which shouldn't be looked at as being superior to BIA schools. The assimilation aspect was just as acute given the curriculums and prejudices. The number of students attending public schools really took off around 1920. Um, here, 10 years later on this slide, we can see a snapshot from just one reservation of how many students were attending each type of school, and over half were at a public school. Again, as with mission schools, the local BIA agency required reports from public schools, so if these were saved, one can find proof of attendance and some limited information. You see public school records come up a lot in financial files, since reservations are exempt from property taxes. Some school districts required the BIA to pay for each student, setting off a complicated formula for that exact cost. This image here uh, from the Library of Congress it's simply the best image I could find for an early 20th century rural school. Native children probably didn't attend this one in Huron. It's a few hours from both the Flathead Reservation to the east and the Coeur d'Alene Reservation to the southwest. Next slide, please. Slide number 13. So for a visualization of school locations and how they changed, I want to, uh, I want to show you a couple of maps. Next slide, please. Slide number 14. Here are the schools in 1899. Both types of boarding schools are marked, and the day schools are, are simply numbered. So indulge me for a second. Take a look at Colorado. You see two non-reservation boarding schools noted, Grand Junction and Fort Lewis. Now with that, let's jump ahead 20 years. Next slide, please. Slide number 15. To 1919. Now, look at Colorado again. Those two schools are long gone, and now there is only a new reservation boarding school on the southern Utes land. 
As mentioned earlier, this was emblematic nationwide, the, the closure of schools throughout the years, and it leads us to a records problem that I like to call, next slide please, slide number 16, law schools, or at least that's what I call them. As I mentioned before, non-reservation schools were sort of their own little island, reporting directly to DC. The rule of thumb I seem to have found that if they closed before World War II, the records of the school were often not saved. What remains is a spattering in various general BIA files. Some agencies at different time periods, like the Navajo Agency and the Wind River Agency, compiled student case files from all types of schools across the country of all reservation children. And so case files from law schools can show up that way. Agency reports on who they sent, agency student censuses or annual and statistical reports into DC are all additional sources about the activities of the law school. In this slide, we see some records from one such law school, the Genoa Boarding School that was in Nebraska, closed in 1934. This graduation commencement program can be found in New Mexico's Charles Burke School records and this list of students found in Montana's Flathead Agency records. Often in these cases too, uh, local institutions and colleges will work to assemble what little documentary record is left on the school, as well as collect oral histories and whatnot, so to sort of create a uh, more of a localized history for them. Next slide please, slide number 17. Before we go any further into our talk today, into student case files, let's detour quickly to restrictions. General school and agency records typically have few privacy restrictions given their age, but that is not the case with student case files. Privacy laws are in place to protect the individual. There can be information that isn't the most flattering or whatnot in these files. So even with those that are old enough to be open, bear that in mind when researching. But really, they were kids. Kids often in horrible places, horrible situations. I mean, I myself got into trouble in the 10th grade, convicted of obstruction of justice, ended up on probation, so such troubles or disciplinary records are hardly indicative of the individual. Generally speaking, a student case file is closed to the public for 75 years after record creation. As long as the student is alive, only they or someone with the power of attorney can access it. If a student dies, that restriction ends, and this can be proved with a death certificate or given that later records have social security numbers, the social security number death, death index. But it is on the researcher to prove it. Many student case file series are mixed with dates, so the entire series is closed to blanket reference until all the files are older than the 75-year restriction. The case files used in the rest of this presentation today are all open, either because they're old enough or, unfortunately, are from students who passed away. Next slide, please. Slide number 18. And one more stop before we dive into student case files, I want to talk a little about names. In the early years, a big part of the assimilation process was the assigning of English names, and dissertations have been written on this very topic, so I won't dwell, but to say that school records can be a useful tool in reflecting this, where one can see what was changed and better help connect other genealogically useful records. So here we see an excerpt from a list of students showing the assigned English names. Later in history, names also present a roadblock of sorts for research, especially in tribes not used to the idea of surnames, so generic ones, meaning son of or grandson of, were created. And then, as unfortunately given the high mortality rate, even into the 20th century cost, children shifting around and thus acquiring new surnames. Then lastly, you have the possibility of incorrect, different spellings by officials. So the shifting of family and misspellings are both seen here on this slide. All four of these records are for the same Betty. So all these issues can add wrinkles in researching. And with that caveat, let's now look at some actual student case files, what one can find in the boarding and high school case files up through the 1970s. Next slide, please. Slide number 19. So, the earliest student case files, they are really even hardly that, when you can find them. For some schools, like the Albuquerque Indian School, opened in 1881, fires during the history destroyed early records. So here's one for Francis King, who came from the Oklahoma Territory to Carlisle, and this is it. 
their scant biographical info, how long she was there, and then a follow-up form and what she did after school. Throughout the history of BIA schools, they were really big on learning what a student did after the school, which can be useful in learning who they married, where they moved, and such. Next slide, please. Slide number 20. So now at the turn of the century, you start to see more records saved. Medical records, applications for the non-reservation schools, outing forms where the students went and how they were, correspondence, detailed grades, promotion records, financial records start to appear, usually in regards to travel to and from the school. And that's the topic of the handwritten note down at the bottom of this slide, where Ramona was given permission in 1918 to go home for Christmas. Um, elsewhere in her file was a letter from 1917 where the school superintendent forbid her from going home that Christmas, her Pueblo only roughly 35 miles due west of Santa Fe. He wrote that no students should go home for Christmas, uh, a real peach, but sadly that, that was the norm in the era. Next slide please, slide number 21. Between the world wars, we start to see more standardized forms across schools, which dive deeper into family info, asking about siblings and what schools they attended, parents' jobs, and we see the first official student photographs. We also start to see more student counselor type records, behavior ratings, as well as standardized testing results. And that, it never fails. I see some of these and I have flashbacks to those Iowa basic tests that we had to take in elementary school. Also present starting around now will be earlier school records from day schools and other boarding schools, starting to give one a more complete glimpse of the entire academic career. Next slide, please, slide number 22. As we saw to a limited extent in Francis's early file from Carlisle, we now start to see extensive documentation of post-school life actual questionnaires that are mailed to students after graduation to inquire as to what they've done. So with John's case, it was most likely due to his closeness to the principal, as evidenced in the personal postcards he sent here as he trained to become a Marine code talker. Uh, side note, Warito did go on to serve with distinction in the Pacific, earning the Bronze Star and Purple Heart in his three battles. But we also start to see records that are more personal writings or artwork from the students themselves, as well as more detailed transcripts. Counseling records, health records, standardized testing results, travel records, however mundane, do lead to large files at times. Students and work programs will have forms detailing that work and location, where at, and then the evals for the work. And then hearkening back to the early years of BIA schools, vocational training was again emphasized for some students. There was a special six-year program for older students, 16 to 20 years old, with little or no education. They had received the basics and then some sort of vocational training and, and leave with a certificate. Next slide, please. Slide number 23. And this is a similar to our last slide with some extras. Here at the Inner Mountain School, we see annual student photographs, yet more detailed academic records, and often soundscriber discs of the student's diction exercises. The poor material and recording system means the quality varies and cannot handle many playbacks. Our, our motion picture branch does have the capability of attempting to capture the audio, though our field units have nothing locally to do so. In this era, you also may see tr university transcripts. Again, the BIA was very interested in the post-school life and so would collect such records. Next slide, please, slide number 24. So for mentions and records of individual students, we talked about the case files. But now let's talk about where you can find additional files about students, schools, the type of records, and how to locate them. And in some cases, it's easy. There are dedicated series from a school, whether it's a attendance ledger or an administrative file series from a certain school. However, in other cases, you have to dig into the general BIA agency files to glean out the school-related records. BIA agencies used a host of filing codes varying by agency for many years until a standard decimal code system was put in place in 1926. With those codes, one can narrow their hunt within hundreds of boxes to zero in on school records that might be of use. It is important to note, the records saved do vary greatly by agency. So what you might find, say, in the Fort Bidwell agency records out in California won't be the same or as detailed as what you might find in the Shawnee Indian Agency records down in Oklahoma. 
Now, some agencies would lump all their administrative files together in a massive series, and others would split them out into education, construction, financial. Again, it, it varies greatly by agency. Next slide, please, slide number 25. So let's dive into what's out there. I've mentioned reports before, so we'll start there. The government, the government loves reports. And here are two examples detailing mission and public school attendance found in the Fort Belknap agency files under the 800 file code of education. So in the earlier years, the agencies would compile these descriptive lists of pupils, this one here from 1887, for kids sent to each particular school. Now these reports evolved, but the information stayed largely the same as seen in this 1936 attendance report. Likewise, even more reports emerged in the 20th century. Student censuses found in the 54 decimal code are these massive lists of all the students overall and the schools they attended. Then there were the annual, semi-annual, quarterly, monthly, I'm not joking here, reports that were generated for the headquarters in DC that were both statistical and narrative discussing the operations and accomplishments of the schools. Now, remember back when I said non-reservation schools reported directly to DC? It's in these formal reports, largely, re largely reproduced on microfilm series M1011, that are one of the best sources to find out more about those law schools we talked about. But back to this slide. This report on attendance of students at public schools are a boon to find, because if you're researching someone who didn't go to a BIA school, you might still find where they attended via such reports, as long as you know the tribe. Again, though, it can be a crapshoot if they were saved. Now, all right, we've talked enough about reports. Moving on, moving on. Next slide, please, slide number 26. Now, let me just get a drink of water quick. All right, yeah. so individual health records, they can be found in the student case files, but general health records can also be found. And while they may not be perhaps of the greatest use to individual researchers, the aggregate information found in them can be a goldmine for academic researchers studying health issues. Schools struggled with illnesses. Outbreaks of smallpox, measles, tuberculosis, trachoma were constant issues. Here we see a form for documenting students' weights. We see a monthly report from the Charles Burke School down in New Mexico. Sorry again for bringing up reports. And then unfortunately a, a plat of the cemetery at the Santa Fe School. Uh, BIA records, especially early on, show how cold the agency could be in these regards, sending sick students home seemingly before they passed or demanding parents pay to ship the bodies home of deceased students or else not get the bodies back. Again, this academic topic is better explained and addressed elsewhere, but here is, here's where the records are found. Next slide, please, slide number 27. not really pertaining to individuals, but I found that researchers often enjoy the records of the school buildings an ancestor attended, where they were and how they were laid out. These can be found in several filing codes within general files, education matters, but also building and construction. This 1861 classroom diagram comes from our cartographic branch in College Park, Maryland, and the school land plat, showing for instance where the well water was good and bad, comes from a lodgepole school up in Montana. Next slide, please, slide number 28. As we all probably remember, school newspapers are newsletters from our own education. BIA schools were no different. Um, these are very sporadic. Technically speaking, they probably should have been considered temporary records, but were saved anyways and are now found in our collections. Some schools were good about saving them and others not so much. Our online catalog, which we'll talk about later, is a good place to start to see what might be easily discoverable. For the Chilocco School in Oklahoma, our Fort Worth branch has digitized many of the Indian School Journal magazines from there and placed them online through our catalog. These seen here were saved by the Navajo Agency for, uh, for whatever purpose. Next slide, please, slide number 29. Sports. Sports were a big part of the BIA school experience, and this is really seen in the general admin files with rosters, photographs, letters detailing equipment acquisition. Here we see the dominating 1933 season of the Albuquerque Indian School football team, as well as the women's basketball team from the Rapid City Indian School. Early on, uh, women's basketball was pretty big. The girls team from Fort Shaw in 1904 
after going undefeated across Montana, beat an all-star team in St. Louis, Missouri twice to be crowned the world champions at the World's Fair that year. Next slide, please. Slide number 30. Schedules are another of those items, along with menus, too, that one can find in agency records that further flesh out a student's tenure, what exactly they did and when. Here we see one such daily schedule from the Sherman Institute out in Riverside, California. Next slide, please. Slide number 31. Then there are the generic photographs capturing student life. Here we have a classroom shot from a glass plate negative of the Chilocco School, along with a 1971 shot, one of my favorites, of a student band up in Oregon at the Chemoa School. Next slide, please, slide number 32. And then lastly, student art, found either in case files or in dedicated folders or scrapbooks. Here are a couple pieces from, from students here in the Southwest. Next slide, please, slide number 33. All right, so let's tie it all up in a research example. Gretchen Olerking was born on the Fort Belknap Reservation back in 1922. Here we see her at age three, captured in the photographs that accompanied her family's industrial survey entry taken in 1925. Next slide, please, slide number 34. So you go the easy route first, you run her name through our online catalog of collections, folders, and items, and you get a student case file hit. Next slide, please, slide number 35. Which, after clicking on reading, you see the file is located here in Denver at the National Archives branch. So you reach out. Next slide, please, slide number 36. And we get our student case file. The file is thin, but given it's from a reservation boarding school, it is somewhat rare and gives us some good info. Again, note we have a misspelled name. Old King, that was corrected to Older King. Had that not been caught, our research would have been derailed a bit. This is also why when we get a student file request, we end come up empty. We often think outside the box and for different iterations in case the name was spilled, misspelled in like this regard. Next slide, please, slide number 37. And we also get a copy of an application to the Haskell School. Now this is the best source of seeing exactly what other schools she attended. Note how she first attended a boarding school, then a day school, before heading to a non-reservation boarding school. Now these applications are filled with genealogical information on the family, as well as personal info on the student, such as hobbies and books they enjoyed. Next slide, please, slide number 38. So with dates and other school names, we then dig into the Fort Belknap agency records regarding schools, and we find some rosters from her time at the day school and the boarding school. Note the, uh, the one week gap in attendance of everyone at the big warm school there on the left. Elsewhere in the folder, it was noted that the school was shut down due to a measles outbreak. Next slide, please. Slide number 39. We also get a schedule of what her day was like at the boarding school. Now I know there's lots to read in these two images, so I'll take a break here to note at this point that all these slides are available for download and reviewing on the National Archives virtual genealogy page. Next slide, slide number 40, please. So researching further, since she applied to the Haskell Institute, she might have went there. So we go back to our online catalog and look up records from that school, and we see they're at our Kansas City facility. Yeah. Next slide, please, slide number 41. And it turns out she did. The Bismarck Indian School she was attending closed, another of our law schools, so she transferred. We now have an updated photograph and, again, a misspelled name, Gretchen, Gretchen, I don't even know why you would think it was spelled that way. Next slide, please, slide number 42. But as is sometimes the case, the previous school records are carried over, so we still get an academic snapshot of her time at Bismarck, seen here on the left, in addition to Haskell, seen here on the right. Next 
slide, please, slide number 43. And we also get the original version of our application. As I mentioned before, these standard four-page applications have a great deal of information. Gretchen enjoyed volleyball, for instance, and reading, Call of the Wild, Tale of Two Cities, Indians at Work magazine, which was actually published by the BIA to highlight CCC ID activities. Um, the Smithsonian is a complete run of these online. Ours are a little more scattered, but uh, getting a little bit off topic. Now, uh, next slide, please, slide number 44. Gretchen's entire Haskell student case file is 132 pages, um, largely because of material like this, memos, evaluations, schedules. Next slide, please, slide number 45. And lastly, Gretchen actually doesn't have much for health records. Typically, you'd find physical immunization records, but not here. This is about it. It's a doctor's note regarding a swallowed pin in her sewing class. Next slide, please. Slide number 46. So how does one do their own research? Our online catalog is useful, as we have seen throughout this talk, for learning what record series are out there, which schools have their own collections, or where agency records are at, and it can be searched by keyword, creating agency, date, record group, NARA facility. Feel free to play around at catalog.archive.gov. In some cases, student case files can be inquired into via phone or email and copies made out to send. But as many of the research avenues mentioned today, one will need to visit in person at a National Archives location and really dig into the records, as very little is digitized and available online and the work needed to go through the folders is beyond what our staff can do for the public. BI records are located coast to coast, from our grand facility on Pennsylvania Avenue to the National Archives at San Francisco, with a host of additional locations within that 2,817-mile span. Next slide, please. Slide number 47. Another good start is our American Indian Records webpage, where you can learn more about starting genealogy research, explains the type of records, provides information on which tribes are covered by which agencies and where those records are at. There is a page here that lists agencies and tribes by state, as well as a page for BIA schools that have dedicated record collections arranged by state. We have some big improvements coming to this site in the next year or so, so please, please check back. Next slide, please, slide number 48. So before I open the floor to questions, I wanted to pause a moment to tell a story of a former student at the Intermountain Indian School in Brigham City, Utah. Tony Deadman of the Navajo Nation graduated in 1964 with vocational training to be a welder and was widely praised by a school advisor. One year later, however, he found himself arriving in South Vietnam, and 10 months after that, he was killed in action in an ambush on a no-name hill, along with 11 of his airborne comrades. So I'd like to, dedicate, like to dedicate this talk today to Tony, to all the other BIA school alumni, the warriors, who gave their lives in defense of a country that often looked upon and treated them as second-class citizens, if as citizens at all. So thank you. Appreciate your talk. That was a next slide, please. Slide number forty-nine. All right. So, do we have any questions queued up? Any questions live? Yes. Thank you, Cody, very much for your excellent presentation. You've already had a number of compliments, and you might be having invitations coming in for uh, some other conferences. And, and here I am battling a battling a cold too, and uh, yeah. I appreciate that. <laughs> You're welcome. On behalf of our online audience, so far I have uh, about, looks like six questions. Uh, we'll start with a very, uh, hopefully easy one. Are there any records of teachers at these schools? Yes, yes. They're actually often, and that's another common um, research topic. We'll have people coming in who have ancestors that were teachers. A lot of the school records and the general records will have letters handwritten by the teachers. Um, additionally, I'd like to give a shout out to our St. Louis facility. 
It's not part of the record group 75, but the um, employee files for people that work for the BIA are kept with the civilian records in St. Louis at our facility there. Um, so if you have an ancestor you believe worked for the BIA as a teacher or whatnot, you should reach out to them and see if you can get the uh, employee case file. From that, you can then see what agencies they worked at and then reach out to the different units to see if you can find more records on what your ancestor did or that person did. Oh, that's great news to hear. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to start on one side of the coast of the U.S. and go to the other with our next set of questions. So your next question is, my great-grandmother is 100% Native American and believed to have been raised by a white family. Are there any other records for children in New England about 1842, specifically New Hampshire? The earlier records especially for that era, get a little difficult um, because at the time they weren't really concerned with, I don't want to say cataloging, but um, listing. At the time it was you know, the removal era and whatnot, especially in the East. And the BIA hadn't really did the widespread censuses that they would do later on. Um, generally speaking, it's a lot easier to pin down relatives starting around 1880 when the BIA required censuses from all the different agencies. Um, they, by eight, in the 1840s, there were only some limited ones going on with the tribes that they were, they were unfortunately trying to push out. Um, so with that said, it might not have a lot of luck within our federal records, but again, sometimes local institutions might have stuff. Um, the earlier back you go, the better luck you'll have with local, local historical societies and whatnot, as, uh, as the government just didn't keep as detailed records. Okay, thank you for that answer. Our next question is about treaties. The question is, and then I'll give you some more detail about what they're looking for. The question is, is there a link that can be provided to the new online images of the treaties? I'm specifically looking for the treaties made in California, 1850s, that were not ratified. All right, well, let's break that into two. Um, I'm drawing a blank. Oh, the treaties are kept in a different record group not record group 15, that's VA. Uh, I can't remember the record group number. But they all are in the catalog um, under a particular series in that record group, and then you can kind of browse them. Now, as for non-ratified treaties, last I heard, they actually are still working on digitizing that collection. They had some extra funds left over from doing the ratified ones, and they found that the non-ratified ones needed some conservation and work and whatnot. So those are in progress. Um, I don't have any kind of idea on the time frame of when they would come out. but. Rest assured, they are being worked on as far as digitization goes. Okay, that's great news. Um, at least I have a glimmer of hope there. So the next two questions are about specific schools. Uh, the first question is, I did not see anything about the Shawnee Mission School in Kansas. Was that because it was not associated with the federal government? Yeah, and usually if it said mission school, it was run by, by some religious institution. Um, the Catholics ran most of them, but there were other um, denominations that did, did have schools as well. Um, again, like I said, if you know the, the tribe that your ancestor or the person you're researching was from, you can go to that agency and see if you can find any mentions of them being sent there. But as far as school administrative records from those mission schools, we, they just weren't collected by the federal government. Um, in the case of Catholic mission schools, they did have a Bureau of Education and in the Catholic bureaucracy, and those records are at Marquette University. Um, again, I'm not too familiar with what they have, though. Well, it's great that you did have an answer about Marquette. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, going back to the National Archives holdings, are there certain BIA schools that are particularly well documented compared to other schools? Yes. Yeah. By far, at Carlisle is, um, and I think that's for two reasons. One is the first, so it was kind of the kind of the bellwether for what was to come. So it's used as a symbol in that regard, and also that those records are found in D.C., which have always been a little more just better described and better accessed. Um, I would maybe I'm a little biased because I'm in the West, but there's quite a few other non-reservation boarding schools out here that have pretty pretty extensive collections that we're really starting to describe and get better into. Um, so I think there's still a wealth of information that can be found out here. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. 
At this time, I have one more question, but we might have a few more. But for now, our last question looks to be about, it's a general research question, and it is, how do you get pictures of the documents when making a personal visit to the National Archives? Well, you, you know, it's, even in the short time I've been here, it's really shifted. Um, you can bring in your own scanner, at least out here in the field units, you can bring in your own laptop and scanner. Um, but most people now are simply taking them with cell phones. Uh, as long as there's no flash, there's really no problem. A lot of the older stuff is a little more fragile, so that's actually a better way of capturing the image than, say, using a photocopier or a, you know, a flatbed scanner. But, yeah, feel free to drop in uh, to any of our regional facilities, find what you like, and, and make copies or pictures. I'm, uh, let's give the audience a moment to see if there's any more questions. You were very thorough, apparently. Again, you had a lot of really nice compliments that came in. It's a lot of info. Um, so again, if anybody has questions later on down the line, you know, feel free to shoot them to inquire, and we'll, we'll get you set up. Wonderful. Thank you. So as uh, Cody said, uh, if you have questions that we did not get to or you think of them later, uh, please send them to inquire at nara.gov, and please reference Mr. White's session so we know that the question is for him. Videos and handouts will remain available after the event from this YouTube page and from the FAIRS webpage.